Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. I'm Maddie, and you are listening to an episode in our podcast series, Oh, the Places You Will Go, an SLP Spotlight, where I get to interview speech pathologists who have interesting positions in our field, from the very basic to the most interesting spots, places, people they work with, and all of that in between. I get to have the fun of just chatting with these SLPs, finding out what they do, how they got their jobs, and any words of advice they have for other SLPs. So listen as we explore all the wonderful things an SLP can do. Welcome to this edition. This is going to be a fun one. We are here with Sarah Va- Va- Vaca. Vaca. Yeah, it's Vodka with that, the D, so Vaca. It's spelled differently. That's why I stumbled on it just a little bit. Welcome, welcome. You had a funny story about your name. I loved it. You want to share it with us? Oh, yeah. So it's Sarah Vodka, but it sounds like vodka without the the D phoning. Um, so my husband, before I met him or when I first met him, that's how he introduced himself. And that's how I remember the name and things led from there <laughs> of how we say Vodka. Cute, cute. It's it's fun to have a way to remember things. Um, You are here today. You and I met on Facebook, I believe, Mm -hmm, and you responded to one of my queries. And you said, this is what I do. I do fees and I love what I do. And I do a journal dysphagia club. And I said, oh, please come and talk to us. (laughs) So you are our first guest that we've had where you do all you do is mobile fees. All day, every day fees. It is the best part of our field in my personal opinion i i love being able to help figure out what a problem is and help patients get back to eating it's such a huge part of quality of life that i just it's really exciting every day is new and there's a lot a lot of reward that comes from it a lot of answers or a lot to be gained in a very short amount of time I would, I would totally agree. I would totally agree. I think if I wasn't in my hospital outpatient setting, I would look into mobile fees for sure, for sure. And yeah, tell me more about how you got into this position because you didn't roll right out of grad school. No, no, I, I don't think that's a, that's a wise plan. There's a lot of prep work I think that needs to happen before you jump into fees with both feet. So I've been in the field for over 10 years and a big part of that 10 years has been in different care settings, um, primarily uh, skilled nursing and home health. And so I built up a really good foundation in dysphagia, recognizing how to assess it at bedside, intervention, just being comfortable and aware of all that different pieces and parts to the mechanism. And then I had just uh, started at a new SNF and I needed an instrumental done for a patient. And I was asking the, the rehab manager there, you know, who's the, the mobile MBS company that, that comes out for these studies? And they said, no, we have a, a fees contract. And I was like, what? Tell me more. <laughs> so we, we got this question scheduled. Yeah. yeah. So we, we scheduled for the fees and... Um, the, the endoscopist came out and I was basically glued to her side, like just watching from start to finish, helping during the assessment to, to feed. And, and afterwards, she was so kind to um, analyze the video with me and talk through the different parts and things that she was looking for. And I like, this is the coolest thing in the world. This is what we've been waiting for, what I've been waiting for. So... I would, I would see her intermittently as I needed studies done and always that same encouraging, supporting attitude about keep learning. This is, this is cool. So I took it upon myself to go take the, the training course and start that process to being competent in fees. And it just happened to be at the right time where she was looking to bring on additional help to help fill in vacation coverage and just fill in the, those peaks where we were really busy times. So she helped complete my supervision portion of competency. And then as the business kept growing, 
she decided, she's like, I, I need you on a more consistent basis. I need you, I need you to be with me. So I was offered the position to make that my primary role and I, I eagerly jumped to it. Sounds like a good career choice. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you like the mobile fees so much? Oh, there's, there's a lot of perks to it. I, I, I told you about that high reward. Like it's very rewarding to be able to say to somebody, you know, I know you've been eating through this tube in your nose or through your stomach, but your swallow looks, looks great. Let's get you eating something or, you know, you were right when you said that you were feeling something here. There's something that needs to go on. We need to uh, refer. So I, I like being able to give people answers. Mm -hmm. And I like that this role gives me a lot of flexibility. So if I need a half day off because there's something going on with my kids, I can do it. If I need to work uh, longer days because we're really busy or there's something coming up, I I can pick up extra hours. I can push more into my day and it just works really easy around my life schedule. Yeah, that's that's nice to be able to have that flexibility. Yeah. How has COVID changed your work? Uh, in in some ways, COVID has made it changed a lot, and others, it's still it's still the same. So we still do our assessment. People still have the same criteria on when it's appropriate. We mm-hmm. just approach things a little differently. So we always take into consideration sanitation and personal protection when we were doing any study whatsoever. And pre-COVID, we would we would see people who were infectious and we would don all of our PPE. And now it's like we consider every patient as infectious, whether they're considered positive or negative or even a history of COVID. So it's constantly that that headgear, that face gear, full body coverage, um, extra precautions on additional wiping down the cart or the equipment and really taking that time to think through and, and prepare. What am I going to be doing three steps ahead and what kind of equipment will I need? So walk us through a day, uh, walk us through a day, what a, a typical day that you have doing mobile fees. Okay. So usually the, the day or two before I will get my schedule of where I'm going to be. Um, right now we're covering a large portion of Northeast Ohio. So I never know if I'm going to spend my day all inside Cleveland limits or if it's going to be more a day like today where I have over an hour drive between each of my studies. So depending on how far I have to drive depends on how many studies I can see. So in an, in an eight hour day, I might see three patients. I might see five or six if there's multiple at the same facility and the facilities are all close to each other. So at at each facility, I will meet the treating therapist and we'll do a mini chart review, um, concerns, or any special requests that she has during the assessment. Like we need to test this type of uh, cup or we need to test with a speaking valve without or the the patient can't be moved in this position. Um, we'll do the assessment, um, talk over recommendations, what the, the video is showing us, what concerns or positives that we see. I like seeing positives. And we will also spend some time talking about treatment approaches, which I, falls back to your earlier question of a positive about this job is that I get to interact with so many different therapists and spread these little seeds of knowledge and even gain some about what new things that they're doing with their patients that are working for them. And then I go and share the news. (laughs) I love that. I love that. And I love the collaborative approach. I know when I do video swallows in the outpatient setting, a uh, patient will come in from a sniff. If I'm lucky, I know a little bit about what that treating speech pathologist is looking for. And then I have to do a very good job on my report because that is the only thing sometimes that goes back with that patient to that mm-hmm. sniff as a communicative tool of 
what went well, what didn't go well, what are the recommendations, what compensatory strategies to use. So I'm really relying on that report to be, you know, just top notch. I love mm-hmm. that you can go into the facilities, work side by side with the treating SLP and really do um, an eyes on, hands on, this is what we have, collaborative approach. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, I I love that. And that was one of the biggest things that I saw in, in our area is, uh, particularly in those skilled nursing settings, is that there's just one SLP and they're like, I don't know anybody else or I can't get a report from the hospital or I don't understand XYZ on it and I don't know who to contact. I just get this runaround for the hospital system. So that was part of the reason why we had our formed our journal club was that so these SLPs could put a name to a face to a name on a report or recognize who who their local speech therapist was in the setting above them or the setting below them and have a better way to connect directly to that therapist to get access to those reports, to understand those reports Mm -hmm. better, and even to just compare how that patient presented at their level compared to where they are now. Good, good, Good recommendations there. I get so many students that I hear from who... And on the Facebook groups that I'm part of, and they're um, they're starting their clinical fellows, and they have very limited uh, dysphagia experience, mm-hmm. and they feel lost and scared. They understand the implications and the, the seriousness of what they're working with, and uh, they truly care, they care about their jobs, and they need more resources. Yeah. So, go ahead. Oh, I was going to wait for you to finish, but. I, I can tell you about that talking to building that network, that support mm-hmm. system to help as a, as a new clinician provide that mentoring that you probably mm-hmm. need to an extent. Grad school doesn't cover everything in regards to dysphagia. <laughs> <laughs> no, my grandpa used to say the smartest you are is when you graduate from college because then you think you know everything. And then the more you get into the world, you are the more you realize you don't know, and the more questions you have, which I think yeah. is normal. So yeah. being able to reach out and work alongside with an experienced clinician like you would be huge. So that really is is a, a favor in the mobile fees because yeah. it an experienced clinician out into the SNFs into those facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just being, giving them that support that they're not alone, that there's somebody that they can talk to or somebody else who's feeling that same thing that they are. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've found over my years that just simply asking or inquiring, people are more than welcome to want to help you. Or if they can't help you directly, they have a suggestion on what to do or who to contact. And I've never been flat out like, no, not doing it. I'm not helping you. I'm not giving you any information. I don't think speech therapists are wired that way. No, no we're not. Yeah. But so here, you'd like to learn something? Here you go. Here's something more. Yeah, yeah. And here's beyond that question that you right. asked because we want you to know, we want you to be good at your job. People's lives depend on you. Yeah. Hence the purpose for these podcasts. It's reaching out, sharing, teaching, questioning, um, just having those authentic conversations about who are you, what do you do, what does your day look like. Tell me more about your um, the types of buildings you go into, the patients you work with. Tell me about your pay. So I we go to uh, acute care, subacute, LTAX, and. Um, skilled nursing right now. So we cover a wide variety of settings. We can, we can see a wide variety of patients. A lot are new strokes or progression of degenerative diseases. So like your dementia, your Parkinson's, um, even some MS. Um, typically we skew towards the older adults 
Typically, they tend to have more trouble swallowing. But we do get some younger patients that have been involved in car accidents or even acts of violence. So younger ones pop up, but they tend to skew towards the older adults. Um, Pay-wise, it's... I'm PRN, so the schedule works different. But typically, because of the skill level and the length of time for the assessment, we're typically paid more than, say, your average uh, speech therapist in a skilled nursing setting that has a higher patient volume, but it's more intervention-based, which isn't reimbursed as high. Okay. If there's a speech pathologist who's listening to this podcast and she's inspired by you and wants to go and become a specialist in mobile fees like you, how many years of experience would you say she have or he have before they start on your path? Oh, that's a difficult question to put an exact number to because we've all have different experiences with dysphagia. Some of us come from grad schools that were very heavily focused on the medical component and they got a lot of anatomy, physiology, maybe more than one dysphagia course, I can hope. Um, And then some of us come from a background where grad school was very focused on pediatrics and education and language development. And maybe our externships weren't necessarily in a acute level uh, med program. Uh, I know that one of my meds experience was actually a aphasia daycare type setting. So it wasn't it was considered adult, but it wasn't that hands-on, let's look at that chart every day. These patients are acutely ill and their status changes. So having that experience, you're probably going to need more time in that field to develop that dysphagia foundation before you're going to be ready to understand and not interpreting fees. That's the harder part. Teaching somebody to scope is scope mechanics is the easy part. It's all that work that comes after when you have that video that takes that learning, that challenge, that time. So this would be a good question for somebody in a journal club. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Talk about your, you, I, when we talked, you said you had, now we talked before this because we prepped for our interview today. You said you are part of a journal club that has over a thousand people in it. Tell us about that. Uh, not a thousand. <laughs> this oh. is just over a hundred. Oh. A little different. <laughs> One day we'll get to a thousand, maybe. <laughs> But, but it, I'm, I'm proud of it because there was there was nothing in this region. It was just all isolated therapists who didn't talk to each other, didn't know that there was existence <laughs> beyond their small little hospital system or their SNF. So it started with just five close friends that I, I had and we got together and um, not going to lie. I mean, being a a mobile endoscopist, I see a lot of therapists and I would start planting these seeds like, hey, you know, there's other people, other medical SLPs who have questions and who want to learn and you should come join and be a part of us. And the the response has been so positive with people that this just has grown fairly quickly. And just wanting to be a part of something, wanting to learn, wanting to know who to connect to if I want to transition to a different care setting, or even I've seen people are saying, you know, our hospital system is growing, or we have, we're opening a new position, and they've been able to connect with other speech therapists in our group about interviewing for that position that actually led on to them being hired. So it's it's been really amazing to see that connectivity occurring in our area. Seems very natural. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, nobody's forced to do something or, you know, standards that they have to abide. Like you have to be a part of this and you have to have this opinion. It's very nice to share how you clinically approach a patient and how you incorporate the evidence that you're reading or reading more now because we're introducing and sharing and being motivated to 
pull in that research to make our patients better. Excellent. You have included um, as a gift to us a beautiful resource, How to Build a Professional Network, which will, will be part of the show notes. Um, and the four steps are uh, five steps, introducing yourself, stay current, uh, joining or starting a journal club, be active in the field and be active in the community. So we're going to put this out in the show notes and on our site and on your site as well. This is a beautiful, um, just a beautiful creation you have here. Uh, thank you. I, like you said earlier, so many newer clinicians struggle with building that network and not knowing how to even take that first step. So hopefully the the strategies will be useful to them in knowing not only to just build a network, but to build a quality one that's going to grow with you and support you wherever you're at in that clinical development. It reminds me, some of the students I work with will say, how do I become really good at my job? I want to be the best. And you just hit upon something right there. It's building a quality network and surrounding yourself with people who do hold themselves to this higher standard and do have that drive and can link you with those resources that are just top Mm -hmm. notch. Yeah, and I I can't agree more. Every new person that I come across or that I meet has led to an opportunity to uh, expand my career into a new area that I never considered before or led me to another individual who shares the same interests and passions. And it's very interesting and it's exciting to know that we have so much in common already with each other and just taking that initiative to ask about something or to volunteer for a new project or even just to try something new outside of your comfort zone Mm -hmm. that it's, it's really rewarding. Mm -hmm. No SLP is an Island necessarily. No. (laughs) That's, That's excellent. So Before we go, would you share with us two stories, one story where something did not go as well, and then a success story? Uh, So I'm just going to share, because you wanted to know what a typical day was Mm -hmm. like. So these two stories have happened this week. Um, A story, we'll go with a story that doesn't end so well, so we can end on a happy note. (laughs) So a story that went unexpected was we were an older gentleman with multiple comorbidities, uh, also had like dementia, Parkinson's. He was, we were doing the assessment and we noticed during the assessment that we aspirated thin liquids. We we're towards the beginning of the study, just getting started. And I cued him to cough and he did cough and scrambled eggs came out of his trachea. Mm -hmm. Um, which was from breakfast three hours ago. So that study kind of took this big left turn and we had to reapproach it and try different strategies and um, ultimately did not go as well as the treating SLP had anticipated, but we, we worked it out and we talked through to the family, to the patients on the wishes and what they wanted. And based on where that patient was in the progression of his diseases, they were okay with him continuing to eating. And that's what their goal was to let him have whatever food he wanted, regardless of where, where that food was ending up. So even that's, that was a negative outcome. It was so helpful to be able to provide that information. Correct. Right. So, so they know, they also were able to know that X, Y, and Z strategy wasn't effective, but a strategy over here provided some minimal safety or made it more efficient for them. So it's mm-hmm. it's nice, even if you know that a patient may not do well because of their history going on, still having that instrumental to tell you to help guide what strategies to maximize safety is still an important component to that assessment. Agreed. Um, totally. And then for my 
Yay story. My happy story was I was at a facility that just brought in a new speech therapist. And so she was looking, she was kind of getting familiar with the building, with the caseload. And she came across an individual who was involved in a motor vehicle accident multiple years ago, several years ago, um, had a peg had a feeding tube and never received any sort of instrumentation or speech services. So he's been NPO for years. We do this study and it's an absolutely wonderful, beautiful swallow. And he was able to have supper later that day. And, you know, he was all excited because his family was going to come to that window and he was going to tell them that I'm eating today. And Having those moments is what makes this job definitely worth it. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. Words of wisdom for the new speech pathologist coming in. I would say to them, never stop learning. Like learn, learn, learn. There's always something to learn. And that, as that saying goes, you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. Mm-hmm. Don't know a lot. Uh, learn and Spend a lot of energy knowing what normal is and the variance of normal. Because without that understanding of normal, mm-hmm. how can you determine that something is disordered? Mm-hmm. So having that normal, and I would say to always advocate for yourself. Advocate for the uh, tools that you need, the assessments that you need to be able to do your job. And your patients will benefit from it. The whole profession is going to benefit from it. When we have this consensus on the standard of care that, you know, for me, it's always instrumental, instrumental, instrumental. You can't assess for vigil phase at bedside. Um, Just constantly advocating. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Sarah. Sarah Vodka. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, you got it. (laughs) Yes, thank Um, you so much. Yeah, this was great. It was fun hearing about your day and your passion and your stories and your words of wisdom. All of your contact information will be in the show notes and the the visual you created for us is going to be there as well. We'll post that out. And I think people are going to love hearing this story. Oh, good. Wonderful. Yes, I'm always available if somebody has another question that comes up that wasn't answered. I'm, like I said, I'm happy to help. Today's conversation has created some aha moments for you and motivated you to become a better SLP, continuing to connect some of those missing links between what you know and how to use that knowledge. Thank you for downloading the missing link for SLP's podcast. And if you enjoyed the show, I'd love you to subscribe, rate it, and leave a short review. Also, please share an episode with a friend. Together, we can raise awareness and help more SLPs find and connect those missing links and get the information needed to help them feel confident in their patient care every step of the way. Follow me on Instagram and join the Fresh SLP community on Facebook. Show notes are always available, so come learn more at freshslp.com. Let's make those connections. You got this.